morning everyone. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. A good day to all our viewers from across Southeast Asia and beyond. Thank you for taking time to join us this morning. My name is Jerome Baradas from Circus Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resources Knowledge Platform. Welcome to Circa Online Learning and Virtual Engagement Webinar, or SOLVE for short. This is Circa's immediate response to the emerging impacts of COVID-19 global pandemic on food security by maximizing the use of information and communication technology, uh, different platforms on, on, of ICTs to inform educate and share evidence-based solutions and tested technologies, as well as best practices on the ground. The short video shown earlier has given you a glimpse about CIRCA and what we do. CIRCA is hosted by the Philippine government on the campus of the University of the Philippines of Banos. So we are from the, Latina, the special science and nature city of the Philippines. Today's online conversation, which will focus on the unrealized potential of animal biotechnology, was organized in partnership with U.S. Embassy Manila and ISA. But before we proceed to our online conversation this morning, Please allow me to just quickly go over some very interesting statistics gathered from the last SOLVE webinar, which was on vulnerability of smallholders to climate change and climate. Let us see the infograph. As you can see, uh, the infograph shows that our online viewers last time were 68% female and the rest were male. This has been the consistent trend over the past 12 web webinars that we've had, where women consistently dominated our online attendance. The infograph also indicates that 84 individuals tuned in via Zoom, while almost 700 joined the webinar through Circa's Facebook page. We are also very happy to note that we've had online attendees not only from the Philippines, but also from Australia, Japan, Malaysia, Myanmar, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, the United States, Vietnam, and Zimbabwe. I know that you are all excited to learn something new today, but let me first encourage you to send us your question. How? Let's see the, the there. For those of you who are tuned in via Circa's Facebook page, you may type your questions in the comment section. And if you are registered and tuned in via Zoom, please post your questions or comments in the Q&A section that you see at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on the gadget you are using. We will collect all the questions and we will answer them towards the end of the session. May we also request you to kindly indicate your location and or, and or your country of origin. It would be good for us to know where you are watching this webinar. We encourage you to please like Circa's Facebook page now by pressing the little thumbs up sign just below the cover photo for us to remain socially connected. By liking our FB page, you will regularly receive updates on our learning events, webinars, and postings on recent developments in agricultural and rural development. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on Circa's FB page and YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Today's presentations will be made available on Circa's website, www.circa.org. The slides 
shown during the past 12 webinars have already been posted on the website. We will also be live tweeting this webinar so you can join the conversation. Please use the hashtag, hashtag CircleSol. If you have issues or, or, or are experiencing technical difficulties with Zoom online platform, please email my colleagues at sol at circa.org. Without further ado, let us begin our webinar, but let us first listen to the message from John Law, the Acting Ambassador of U.S. Embassy, Manila. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to learn about exciting new developments in animal biotechnology. I'm John Law, Chargé d'Affaires of the U.S. Embassy here in the Philippines, and on behalf of the entire embassy team, it's our pleasure to welcome you to today's event. Together with Circa, we're so pleased to bring together three experts from the Philippines, the United Kingdom, and Argentina to talk about this emerging field and how it can improve the lives and livelihoods of Filipinos. The United States and the Philippines share a commitment to a science-based approach to agriculture. Both of our countries joined a diverse group of nations in embracing safe technologies by co-sponsoring an international statement on precision biotechnology at the World Trade Organization. The Philippines is the first Asian country to co-sponsor this statement, demonstrating its commitment and leadership on the global stage in providing farmers and ranchers the tools they need to address the array of challenges we face in producing safe, sustainable, and abundant food, feed, and energy. The United States and the Philippines also pledged to pursue new biotechnology developments together through our 10-year science and technology agreement. This agreement celebrates the strong cooperation between U.S. and Philippine research institutions and expands our joint activities in agricultural, environmental, and health sciences. Whether you're a student just starting your career or looking for new professional challenges, I hope you'll consider joining our efforts. Please visit educationusa.state.gov to learn more about opportunities to study and research in the United States. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I hope you enjoy the discussions on animal biotech and how to use cutting edge technologies to propel agriculture forward, both here in the Philippines and around the world. Before we introduce our first resource person for this morning's webinar, please, um, we'd like to hear from you. It's time for our first poll question. So you can just follow the link for those who are joining us via Facebook and it will be also available to our participants via Zoom. For those who are tuning in via Zoom, it's in the chat box, the link. While you are answering our poll for this morning, the first one, we have three, um, let me introduce to you our first speaker. Dr. Simon Lilico is a research fellow at the Roslyn Institute at the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Lilico has been at the forefront of application of genomic editors to livestock, creating either disease-resistant or resilient strains or accurate models of human disease. He has worked with talents Zinc Fingers and CRISPR Cas9 through collaborations involving key developers of the tools. RD companies in the livestock arena, breeding companies, and international academic institutions. Dr. Lilico holds several patents in the field and is the editor in chief of transgenic research. Dear friends, let us welcome Dr. Simon Lilico. Right, good morning everybody. I am going to talk to you this morning about applications of genome editing and transgenesis in livestock and fish. Um, so to start off, I'm gonna give a little bit of background about the, the sort of the 
long history of animal breeding before I launch into the genome editor part of the talk. So selective breeding is where we'll start. This is the act of choosing which animals get to mate and therefore the genetic combinations which can be passed to the next generation. Now we believe that the wolf was the first species to be domesticated by humans and initial selection is likely to have been for traits such as lower levels of aggression that allowed them to coexist harmoniously with us. Continued selection across thousands of years has resulted in a multitude of dog breeds that guard us, hunt with us, herd our livestock, or are just pretty, and often these have little resemblance to their ancestor. The same can be said for our prey species. So, as you can see here, there's a huge diversity in our sheep breeds because we've selected these to survive and thrive in different conditions and have further selected specific breeds for specific functions, such as the rate at which they grow or the type of wool that they produce. Each of these breeds, in addition to looking different, is genetically distinct from each other. And in fact, if you were to ask a school child in the United Kingdom what colour a pig is, I guarantee that they will tell you that it's pink, because in Western agriculture, our, pen, uh, bleh, our pigs tend to resemble these large white land race animals that have been selected for their feed conversion, their fast growth rates, their ability to produce lots of offspring every year. And they're genetically and phenotypically different from the ancestral wild boar. In essence, domestication and selection have resulted in the genetic manipulation of these species to fit our needs. Selective breeding is also the driver behind the spectacular productivity gains observed in Western agriculture, exemplified here with the milk yield gains from dairy cows in the UK herd over the last 25 years. And what you can see is during that time, the size of the national herd is reduced, but that's balanced against the amount of milk produced by each animal increasing, such that now we produce more milk with fewer animals. However, while genomic selection continues to form the foundation of many commercial breeding programs, it is limited by the genetic pool of the population under selection. In essence, if your trait of interest isn't encoded in the genome of your breeding population, you can't select for it. Genome editing has the potential to offer an effective solution to this problem. So what is genome editing? Well, just as editing is the act of rewriting text, genome editing is the act of rewriting the genome. Using genome editors such as zinc finger nucleases, talons, or the CRISPR-Cas system, researchers can break the genome at a specific position and then effectively rewrite the DNA sequence at that position. So once you've used your chosen editor to create a double strand break, there are two main routes that you can use to resolve that break in the genome. Firstly, researchers can choose to do nothing and rely on the cell's innate non-homologous end joining pathway to fix the break. So this pathway that the cells have is notoriously error prone. And what you tend to get is small insertions or deletions of the DNA at the break site. And if that break is within a gene, this typically results in disruption of gene expression. Now, this approach has been used often in research, and it's really useful when the question is simply what happens when we turn this gene off? The second, pos uh, the second possibility is that we do something by way of supplying a novel DNA template that the cell can use to, break, uh, to repair the break. Um, this template can be used to change anything from a single nucleotide up to insertion of a large transgene at the break site. A final option is to use a pair of genome editors flanking a region of interest to effectively excise this from the genome. I'm now going to give you examples whereby each of these approaches has been used in livestock. So my first examples relate to a viral disease called porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome caused by the porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. There are multiple variants of this virus and the available vaccines are not cross-protective. 
the disease causes late stage abortion in sows. It causes death of young piglets and a failure to grow well in older animals. It has major economic impacts on pig production and in the European Union alone is estimated to cost the sector around about 1.5 billion euros every year. PERS is also one of the biggest contributors to antimicrobial use in pig farming due to the secondary bacterial infections associated with the virus. Now, the PERS virus infects pig immune cells through interaction with a cell surface receptor called CD163. In 2016, Randy Prather's group from the University of Missouri published their work on the use of the CRISPR-Cas system to disrupt the porcine CD163 gene, creating pigs that lacked expression of this protein and which were then shown to be resistant to infection with the virus. Now, the biological role of CD163 in pigs is not as a receptor for a virus. It actually carries out a number of important biological functions. As such, we believe that while knocking out CD163 is a useful step towards PERS resistant pigs, loss of CD163 function is unlikely to be desirable in production animals. So as shown here, you can visualize CD163 as nine beads on a string with the virus binding specifically to bead number five. As such, we took a novel approach and applied a pair of CRISPRs to excise the part of the gene that codes for bead number five. Our idea was that in the absence of this small DNA fragment, the rest of the gene should still be expressed only without the bead to which the virus binds. So now when the virus comes along, it has nothing to bind to, so it can't invade the cell. To test our hypothesis, we generated a small cohort of pigs. So you can see here the eight animals used for our study. Four of these pigs are wild type and four are edited with our small deletion. And as you can see, they all look the same. I can tell you they all behave the same. You can't tell the difference between these pigs just by looking at them. We challenged both cells from the pigs and the pigs themselves with the PERS virus and showed that as we hoped, our pigs were resistant to infection. And the graph here shows the four wild type pigs as orange lines. And you can see the level of virus in the pigs over the two weeks of the study, the virus level goes up, but our edited pigs are the green lines. And you can see that the virus isn't able to divide in those pigs over the same two week period. Now, my next example, I'm going to use cattle as the exemplar species. So in Western agriculture, horns on cattle are largely considered problematic because horns are in effect offensive weapons and the cattle that have horns can cause significant harm either to other cattle or to the farmers who are handling them. Most dairy breeds, such as this Holstein Frisian in the picture, have horns and disbudding, either with caustic pastes or hot irons, or dehorning in older animals are common practice. And this is sometimes performed without pain relief, so it's clearly a welfare issue for the animal, as well as being very unpleasant for the person who has to carry out the procedure. Now, as I said, most cattle breeds have horns, but there are some exceptions. In one of these, there's a natural genetic mutation called Celtic Pold, in which 212 bases of DNA is duplicated. Cattle that have either one or two copies of the Celtic Pold duplication lack horns. So the research team at Recombinetics in the USA used this approach, um, this observation, sorry, to edit this region in horned dairy cattle inserting the 212 base pair region using genome editors to produce two bull calves, which they named Spotty Guy and Buri. And both of these animals lacked horns. And when they were bred against horned dairy cows, all of the offspring lacked horns. So this is a powerful demonstration that we can make specific changes to the genome that have a beneficial consequence. Now, for the next couple of slides, I want to move briefly away from genome editing and consider a much older technology called transgenesis. 
So in transgenesis, a transgene, or in other words, a gene from a different species, is inserted into a plant or an animal, allowing the transgenic organism to produce a new protein. So this is a protein that they wouldn't normally produce. All of these animals here, for example, have had a transgene for green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein, or in the fish, some other fluorescent proteins inserted into their genome. And while this technique has been used for a long time as a research tool to answer biological questions, to date, there's only one transgenic animal that has been approved for human consumption. And that is the Aqua Advantage salmon. So this is an Atlantic salmon with an added growth hormone transgene from a different species of salmon called the Chinook salmon. And it grows more quickly than its non-transgenic counterpart. So in the picture there, there are two fish, the transgenic fish is at the back, the non-transgenic fish is at the front, and both fish are 18 months old. In fact, what this means is that these transgenic fish grow to market weight much faster, meaning that it's economically feasible to grow them in a warehouse rather than in a sea pen. A very similar effect could today be achieved by editing. For example, there is a gene for a protein called myostatin. Myostatin is a protein that regulates how big our muscles grow. So reducing myostatin results in bigger muscles and vice versa. So this Belgian blue bull, for example, has a natural mutation that turns off its myostatin gene, meaning that it grows very, very big muscles. And similar changes have now been edited into a variety of livestock, including this tilapia. Like the salmon, these fish have improved growth and feed conversion rates, meaning reduced input costs. And because they grow to market size faster, a reduced environmental footprint and a reduced risk of disease because they're kept in their pens or their tanks for a shorter period of time. Furthermore, unlike the salmon, they don't contain any foreign DNA. And as such, the Argentinian regulators have ruled that in Argentina, these fish are not subject to GMO regulation. I'd like to point out that genome editors, whichever type we're considering, whether it's the zinc fingers, the talons, or the CRISPR-Cas, they are tools, right? These are tools that allow us to make specific changes to the genome. And because of the huge potential associated with them, there is considerable resource being expended on their design and redesign. And this expansion of the tool set is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. I think it's also important to remember that these tools can be used in a number of different ways. And I've given a few examples of that, but there is a spectrum of potential modifications that can be introduced using them. And this can range from alteration of a single base through to insertion of a large transgene. And that determination of where editing morphs into transgenesis is going to be an important decision for regulators to make. And I'd like to finish with this slide. So if you think of a genome as a blueprint for an organism, it's actually fairly simple for me to then draw comparison with architectural plans, which are the blueprint for a building. If I want to make a change to my home, I may require some form of planning permission from my local authorities. If I want to make a very small change, like putting up a picture hook, for example, I probably don't need to talk to my planning regulator. It's a very small thing to do to your house. But if I intend to do something bigger, then there is a process that I have to follow requiring a planning application that details the changes that I intend to make. And I'll only be granted permission if my proposed changes are safe and if my neighbors don't object. And then once I've had the work done on my house, the regulatory authorities are likely to come around and inspect the work to check that what we agreed that I could do is in fact what I did. Similarly, it would be very useful if genome editing could be ed uh, regulated in a similar manner. Given the costs and time and money required to produce a cohort of edited livestock, a scenario, so this is from my perspective personally, a scenario whereby I could go to the regulator to gain 
in essence, in principle, planning permission in advance of that expenditure would be extremely useful with a clearly defined guidance on the checks that will be performed throughout the project agreed in advance to facilitate final market approval. And I say this because over the years, there have been a number of research projects with significant potential to contribute to the livestock sector that have failed to attain that market approval due to the lack of well-defined processes and escalating costs in the approval process. The Aqua Advantage Salmon that I mentioned earlier is the single exception, but this took 26 years to pass through the regulatory system in the USA with the FDA driving it before they finally got approval for the product. And with that, I'm going to stop for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for giving us a picture of the global state of animal biotechnology, the editing the course of livestock development. Thank you again, Simon. Now to talk about animal biotech regulations, may I call on Dr. Martin Lemma. Dr. Lemma is an adjunct professor at the University of Quilmes, Argentina. Dr. Martin Lemma was the former director of biotechnology at the National Ministry of Agriculture in Argentina and the Executive Secretary of the National Advisory Commission on Agricultural Biotechnology, when it was recognized as FAO Reference Center on Biosafety of Genetically Modified Organisms. He pioneered the development and application of the criteria for the regulation of genome edited organisms for agricultural use that is recognized worldwide. Dear friends, let us welcome Dr. Martin Lemma. Thank you, Jerome, for, for your kind introduction and, and good morning, colleagues. Um, now I will have the, the pleasure to, to share with you some um, information about uh, by the regulation of different biotechnologies applied to animals. Uh, now I'm going to go swiftly through six different kinds of agricultural biotechnologies that are applied in relation with animal health or animal husbandry. The first uh, three of them are, are a satellite to our discussion today, but it is important to to have a whole view of the different regulations applied to different uh, kind of agricultural biotechnologies that are relevant. And the final three are perhaps the more relevant uh, because uh, they are they constitute what we could call in a, in a loose uh, way, uh, biotech animals. So first of all, we have uh, among these biotechnologies that are applied um, in the breeding and of animals or animal health, the first, I say, is a market-assisted breeding. Uh, it's a set of tools to study the genetic uh, composition of, of an animal that has uh, been um, the product of a crossing between two individuals. And uh, this uh, genetic analysis can help to establish which um, member of the offspring uh, has inherited the best traits from the two parent organisms. These techniques are very similar to those that are used, are basically the same or essentially the same that are used in humans, for instance, for paternity tests or to seek for genetic diseases. But in here, they are applied to a different purpose, to, to select the best uh, animals in terms of their genetics, not by the phenotype, but uh, through their uh, the analysis, analyzing their genotype. This technique is uh, not regulated anywhere in the world and it's not necessary because it's just an external observation technique. It doesn't do anything to the animal genetics or, or any other um, um, characteristic of the animal. It doesn't change anything. It's just an, a study from the outside. Then we have a series of, of products uh, that uh, in, in they, they are used as veterinary treatments, uh, like veterinary pharmaceuticals, recombinant vaccines, and also molecular diagnostic uh, tools for finding diseases in animals. Uh, some, of, some of these are quite similar 
to what is used in humans. I mean, some um, the, the molecular diagnostic tools are basically the same that are used in humans to diagnose uh, different diseases. Uh, some vaccines are similar, um, and of, of course, some biopharmaceuticals also. Uh, nevertheless, in, in animals, we have some technologies that are still not in use in, in humans, but we are already uh, applying them to, to animals. Uh, these products, um, when they are obtained through the use of modern biotechnology or recombinant DNA, uh, they do not require a, a specific um, regulatory framework of their own. They are just regulated jointly with the other, pharma, uh, other uh, veterinary pharmaceuticals. Uh, a special mention here is for those veterinary treatments that consist in uh, pure, pure DNA. Uh, this is one example of technologies that are um, have begun to be used in animals recently, but are, are not yet available for human, human treatment. Uh, these uh, treatments using DNA, somehow they are vaccines, or sometimes they um, uh, have the capability of um, making the animal cells to produce uh, certain proteins that are um, that act as a biopharmaceuticals or or some veterinary drug and these uh, technologies uh, once again uh, they do not have a special regulatory framework of their own they all, all, although we are injecting dna in an adult animal um, it doesn't lead to a genetically modified or transgenic animal, just to a few the cells that are made genetically modified for a short period of time. And therefore, these products are regulated jointly with uh, other um, uh, veterinary drugs. Uh, now we, we are seeing a slide that uh, refers to assisted reproduction techniques. Uh, these techniques uh, are quite broad from simple ones like um, in vitro fertilization or to some other more complex techniques like embryo transfer. And nowadays, uh, also in many countries, uh, it is available to perform animal cloning for, for farm um, or livestock uh, production. In, in these uh, technologies, the regulation is mostly focused on laboratory quality so it's not so much the animal or the technique that is uh, under uh, governmental uh, regulation, but the laboratories that perform those, those techniques. And particularly in regards to animal cloning, there is an additional uh, uh, issue in some uh, countries where the, the food for derived from animal clones is um, under uh, scrutiny. Uh, as regards to ongoing discussions um, pertaining the animal welfare issues. In, in Argentina, for instance, uh, uh, the, all of these assisted reproduction techniques are, are used. Uh, in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer are widely used. Animal cloning, not so much, but still the, there are, there are some, some laboratories doing it. And it has been, in our country, has been particularly successful for the cloning of uh, polo horses as you can see in the photo that I have included in this uh, slide. Now we get to transgenesis. Simon has uh, made a great uh, introduction on what is a transgenic animal. Uh, we can have a wide diversity of uh, genetic modifications uh, within transgenic animals from relatively simply simpler uh, modifications, animals that just produce a, a single protein for a simple purpose, to more complex uh, arrangements of genetic changes uh, that uh, sometimes are called uh, synthetic biology. For instance, in the case of the so-called gene drives uh, that are being developed for potentially controlled and wild, uh, wild um, population of pests. The application of GMOs are also very wide. Uh, many of them have been developed potentially for improving food production. Uh, while some others for the so-called molecular farming or the production of uh, special molecules, particularly pharmaceuticals, in, in the animals. This animal, from a legal and regulatory perspective, uh, are uh, considered genetically modified organisms um, and, uh, or, or equivalent terms, but GMO is the most widely used term, 
and GMOs uh, require a specific and ad hoc regulation in, in most countries in the world. Here we can see some examples. Uh, the, on, your, on your left, uh, you have the Envirobig. This was a project for an animal that will make a, a more efficient use of animal feed. <coughs> and at the same time, we'll, uh, we'll have a reduced uh, environmental impact because of that uh, increased efficiency. That was a very interesting project, but it was discontinued uh, after struggling many years with um, the, the regulatory framework. Then we have a photograph of uh, three Argentine researchers that uh, have modified um, a, a, a milking cow. So it produced a, a milk that is more resemblant of human breast milk uh, for, for special uses. Uh, also, we have some photograph here of um, another line of uh, cow, uh, milking cows in Argentina that have been modified for producing a biopharmaceutical in their milk. So here insulin or human growth hormone can be purified from the milk of these uh, cows. There is a cartoonish reference to the uh, genetic modification of pigs to improve their compatibility with humans uh, in regards to xenografting. So in, in these uh, animals, many pig proteins are um, re deleted, I mean, genetically removed uh, or modified. So the, when, when an organ from these uh, animals is, is, is uh, grafted into a human, there is less chance of a genetic, uh, of a immune, uh, immune rejection. Now <clears throat> I'm going to mention the, the um, products uh, consisting or derived from genetically modified animals that are actually in the market. There are not so many of them. Uh, first of all, perhaps in, in, in order of uh, appearance, um, I mean, in, in, in historical order of, of appearance, we have the onco mouse, which is a, a group of animals, um, mice that have been modified to carry a human gene. And that human gene is an onco gene, I mean, a, a, a mutated human gene that gives propensity to suffer cancer. So this animal is an, an improved model for testing um, treatments uh, for cancer that later will be applied in humans. Um, then uh, in here we have a derivative. Um, so, uh, some goats have been genetically modified to produce uh, this um, biopharmaceutical that um, helps uh, people with uh, blood clotting uh, problems to alleviate the, their condition. The, this uh, product, the goats have been approved for this use, and you know, and the derived uh, biopharmaceutical it has also been approved to to be applied to use in, in humans. We have the glowfish that has been mentioned before. This is a this is a pet modified for aesthetical uh, purposes. The aqua advantage salmon that has also been mentioned by Simon before. Uh, this is as he said. This is the only genetically modified animal that has been approved in the United States and Canada for human consumption. Uh, although many GM animals for uh, improving food production has been developed, this is the only one that after many years uh, and a lot of money of in investment in regulatory studies uh, has been allowed to be uh, in the market. The salmon uh, can uh, um, be harvested much sooner and it, therefore uh, it uh, consume less uh, animal feed for producing the same amount of uh, animal protein. And finally, we have the Oxitec mosquito. This is um, a genetically modified Aedes aegypti, which is the vector of um, dengue disease. This uh, mosquito has the ability when released into the environment to reduce the population of their wild relatives. Like, uh, like it is shown in, 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 the, in this uh, slide. And this product in particular has been tested in many countries uh, around the globe. Uh, and finally, uh, it, it received its first uh, commercial approval in Brazil. So in Brazil, it's, uh, it's now legal to, to sell and to use this product to help control in the dengue disease. Well, after referring to um, transgenic animals, and now, now we have a, an additional technique to change the, 
the make changes in the genome of animals, which is genome editing. Uh, Simon has um, described it in, in detail, so I'm only going to refer to the, the regulatory aspects of this. Um, it has been shown uh, before with genome editing, uh, many different kind of changes can be performed into the genome of an organism, but from a regulatory viewpoint, those uh, different options can be separated in two main possibilities. Either with genome editing, we can have small deletions uh, or, or, very, very, or very small uh, insertions, and that are just simple mutants, animals with a mutation that could have happened naturally. Uh, and uh, every time we, we select an animal with a different weight, that's because that animal has a mutation respect to the rest of the, the population of the same species. And here is very similar. So the, the only difference is that the mutation is being generating, generated with molecular biology tools. But there is no insertion of any foreign material. There is, this is not a, a transgenic animal. And um, in terms of uh, regulation, um, this uh, regulatory term that we have used before, genetically modified organisms, uh, in order to have a GMO, there, there, there is a, um, a condition that the animal must have a novel combination of genetic material. That idea comes uh, is related to the original term recombinant DNA. So GMOs are animals with uh, that has some recombinant DNA on them, a novel combination of genetic material, and these simple mutants uh, are not GMO. Uh, then, uh, if applying the technique, the genome editing techniques in some other ways, you can get GMOs, uh, I mean animals with the insertion of a foreign DNA, but with the precise insertions. So we can either have simple mutants or GMOs. In the case of simple mutants that are non-GMOs, many um, developers that really want to, to have a, an improved product uh, and deliver it to the market have been working on, on this part, this simplified uh, version of the techniques. And for instance, you have here three examples on, on the slide. Uh, the first two on the top are, um, are related to Argentine, Argentina. The, the first photograph, you, you can see uh, once again these three happy researchers from my country that now are working on a different um, breed of milking cow. And in this uh, case, they have made a, a small uh, gene uh, addition on the genome of this cow. So it doesn't, the animal doesn't produce any more an allergen in, in the milk. This product has been assessed by the regulatory framework of Argentina, and it was found to be a non-GMO. So it's, it's just a, a simple mutant. Um, also, the, this uh, tilapia uh, that has um, an increased production of uh, meat uh, through the, the, the process uh, or, or the changes that Simon has described. This product was developed uh, outside of Argentina by the same company that has produced the GM salmon, but in this case, no external gene was introduced in the, in the tilapia, only an endogenous gene uh, that controls uh, muscle production has been modified. And uh, therefore, this animal, once again, is co was considered a simple mutant, not, not a GMO. But it's not just Argentina. Uh, another seven countries in, in Latin America have the same regulation nowadays. Uh, one of them is our uh, big brother, Brazil, our neighbor. In Brazil, you have an example that is at the bottom of, of this uh, slide. Um, and in, in there, um, uh, um, animals for cattle for meat uh, of the Angus breed uh, have been edit, genome edited, so in a way that they can now uh, withstand uh, better the heat. And in, in Brazil, being a tropical country, that, that's an issue, especially for this animal breed which is not so comfortable with uh, higher temperatures. But with this uh, small uh, modification in the genome, it's a non, again, it's not a transgenic animals, and the Brazilian Biosafety Commission has uh, confirmed that they do not consider this animal to be a GMO. Uh, this animal uh, now has better chances of being a vehicle to introduce 
this uh, breed that produces high quality meat into a tropical country. Now turning uh, again to um, the regulation for genetically modified animals, GMOs, regulation for GMOs uh, with animal, plant or microorganism um, have three uh, basic or, or main components. One of them is food safety assessment. If uh, we are talking about a, a, an animal that will be used as a source for food, uh, also environmental safety assessment or biosafety assessment uh, that applies uh, all, uh, almost uh, uh, in any case. And besides, we, we may have other aspects as we will see now. The environmental safety assessment is an exploration of risk hypothesis uh, derived from information on the genetic modification and the phenotypic changes. So regulators receive information on the transgene, on the genetic modification, and what uh, changes in the phenotype are displayed by the animal. And, and then you, uh, they use that information to establish if there are risk hypotheses and those risk hypotheses are explored uh, very similarly to a sign, ordinary scientific um, hypothesis. Uh, and this process leads to establishing if, if those, those risks exist or not. There are many references um, available on how to generate uh, or, or how to perform this kind of, of assessment. The most important one is the internationally recognized Cartagena protocol on biosafety, but also there are um, applicable guidelines for the World Organization for Animal Health, from the Organization of um, Economic and Develop Cooperation and Economic, um, sorry, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, and uh, as well as uh, national or regional regulations from, for instance, from Europe or, or even for, from countries like Argentina or Brazil. The food safety assessment um, is simpler in the sense that there is basically one uh, universally recognized guideline on how to perform it for, for recombinant DNA or genetically modified organisms. Uh, this, is, this is the Codex Alimentarius guideline for, for the assessment of food safety. In this guideline, there are, um, there are indications on how to perform the assessment of potential allergenicity and toxicity assessment of any novel protein that is present in, in the animal. We remember it's a transgenic animal, so likely will have a new protein. That protein could be allergenic or toxic. Uh, but that fortunately can be studied and, and uh, assess if it's true or not. Also, there will be a comparative assessment of uh, composition uh, between the, the, the foods derived from the genetically modified animal compared to the, to the conventional or wild type animal. And finally, exploration of additional risk hypotheses depending on what, what is exactly the trait or the genetic modification that has been, has been performed. I, I have referred to other aspects. Um, they may be relevant uh, or very relevant in the case of uh, animals. Um, their, their, uh, their regulatory framework must take into account issues uh, pertaining animal welfare, issues per pertaining uh, if there's going to be a trade impact uh, when, the when the animal is used as a source for products that are exported to other countries. Uh, and in those other countries, perhaps the product has not been presented or yet approved. And there is a, a thing about social perception, uh, how, how, the, how these technologies are communicated and perceived by the public and specific socio-cultural aspects uh, that may relate to the local culture, but also what we, uh, for which purpose the genetic modification has been performed. For instance, we have here examples on animals that have been modified for artistic purposes, uh, animals that have been modified for improving sporting performance, and, and things like that may, may be seen positively or negatively, uh, depending on, on, the, on the local um, stakeholders' uh, position. So all of this has to be taken into account 
uh, at least by the political authority when taking a decision regarding if allowing these products to be commercialized or not. So finally, this is my, my last slide. Um, since uh, the Philippines is, is now in, 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 has the opportunity to revise and, and upgrade its uh, regulation for biotech animals, it's important to take uh, these, these points into account in general for any country that is updating, the, updating some kind of regulation. This <clears throat> regulation for biotech animals has to be harmonized with regulation for genetically modified plants as much as possible. It should contemplate the possibility of uh, managing uh, farm animals, I mean, terrestrial uh, mammals, but all, like, like cattle or swine, but also genetically modified fish, fish, poultry, and even arthropods, <clears throat> because we have examples of that uh, um, close to the market uh, in, in some countries. We, uh, the, uh, uh, comprehensive regulation must contemplate that these animals may be developed for food purposes, but also for various non-food purposes like molecular farming, uh, for pest controls, as we have seen, or also, uh, or even as simple pests like, like the glowfish or this example in the slide of um, uh, pets that pets that, that may be modified so they uh, do not uh, produce allergenicity anymore. The a comprehensive regulation should take uh, into account the possibility of uh, field trials and, and vivariums where animals are being developed uh, until they are ready to be commercialized, but also, of course, the possibility of uh, this, uh, requiring. And, and approving the com a commercial release for this animal, as well as the confined production, specifically for those that produce uh, pharmaceuticals or molecular farming in general. And as I said, a comprehensive regulation must not forget to um, take into account animal welfare issues, the participation of stakeholders, and having a um, in the same regulation or, or, or in a parallel regulation to have a criteria for the so-called new breeding techniques, including genome editing and a policy for um, commercialization of animal clones. So with this, I finish and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martin, for giving us a picture on uh, animal biotech regulation. No? So, um, that we have to be, that we can ensure that it is safe for the environment, for consumption as food, as well as responsive to the different aspects of the community that you have enumerated earlier. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Martin. Um, may I remind our participants, our online attendees watching this learning session via Facebook Live that you can type your questions in the comment section and don't forget to include your location or country of origin. On the other hand, if you are tuned in via Zoom, you may now post your questions via the Q&A box at the bottom or top of the screen, depending on the gadget you are using. Please do not hesitate to send us your questions and hopefully we'll be, we'll be able to answer them later on. Now on to our next speaker, someone who would give us a picture of animal biotech in the Philippines. Let us welcome Dr. Claro Mingala, the, exec the OIC Executive Director of the Livestock Biotechnology Center, uh, one of the three major centers of the Agricultural Biotechnology Program of the Department of Agriculture hosted by the Philippine Carabao Center. Dr. Mingala is a career scientist with a rank of Scientist 3 and is the chair of the drafting committee of the Joint Department Circular on Animal Biotechnology. Dear friends, let us welcome Dr. Claro Mingala. Hello, good, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for having me with, uh, in this uh, seminar. I will share you now my uh, presentation. Okay, so this is my presentation entitled Animal Biotechnology in the Philippines. It is already defined by our, my colleagues earlier, 
what is biotechnology all about? And probably most of you already familiar with the term biotechnology, the art or set of techniques of utilizing living creatures and their products for food, drink, and medicine production, or for the benefit for human and other animals. So uh, probably it's more famous uh, form of biotechnology is those that are being done in plants. But now uh, we have the animal biotechnology. So it has a long history, beginning as far as 8,000 years ago. So uh, the, the, the traditional, uh, traditional way of breeding is already part of biotechnology. So it's, it's a the domestication and artificial selection of animals so that uh, it would uh, yield more uh, meat and milk products. And now we, will go, uh, we are now in entering the modern animal biotechnology system, which is mainly in the event of vaccine uh, development, artificial insemination, and uh, the most recent is those that are already discussed to you by, the, by my colleagues here. So animal biotechnology has seen to produce genetically modified organisms that have health impacts and economic value. So done for a variety of purposes such as drug production, enhancing yields, increasing disease resistance. So the like of the uh, aquabounty salmon and the glowfish and uh, those that uh, produces bioreactors such as the atrin and uh, uh, other bioreactors that are uh, harvested through the genetic engineered animals. So we also go into the potentials of this through the uh, production of uh, genetically modified animals to resist diseases, such as the PRRS uh, resistant pig that are already uh, developed but not yet commercialized by the uh, uh, scientists in the UK and the, Oxy and the famous Oxitec mosquito to uh, control and prevent the spread of Zika virus, dengue virus, or even malaria virus. So biotechnology in the Philippines as early as 1970s, uh, pH projected biotechnology will play an important role in the country agricultural sustainability. The Philippines actually is the first ASEAN country to initiate biotechnology regulatory system through the executive order number 430 in 1990. And it was uh, formed by different agencies or departments in the Philippines, like the Department of Agriculture, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, the Department of Health, and even the Department of Science and Technology, which is actually the, for, uh, the lead department in this kind of endeavor. So uh, through this our, uh, executive order, the National ba Committee on Biosafety of the Philippines uh, was uh, born. So in the livestock biotechnology in agriculture, or we can also say animal biotechnology, uh, as a uh, variety of technologies like the genetic engineering, genetic modification, transgenic recombinant DNA techniques, uh, so that uh, our farmer producers has the op option in the using biotechnology to increase productivity, consistency, and quality enhancement. So we cannot just uh, get rid of those uh, groups that are also criticizing biotechnology application. So because of the food safety issues or those that has a negative uh, connotations with regards to uh, biotechnology applications, maybe probably because of the animal welfare issue or the impact of this uh, application to the ecosystem. Uh, through, the, through the WHO, OIE, or even the FAO, uh, application of biotechnology in animals also uh, encompasses or also included in the uh, areas of concerns with regards to uh, one health approach. 
So of course, uh, as I uh, just said, animal biotechnology benefits advances in human health, improve animal health and welfare, enhancement of animal products and environmental and conservation uh, systems. So as I said, it is included in the One Health approach that would benefit the public health, the human, uh, the animal health and the environment. In the Philippines, we already have existing policies uh, such as the Agriculture and Fisheries Modernization Act of 1997, which is commonly known as the RA 8435. And then we have the RA uh, 8485, which is the Animal Welfare Act of 1998, and the RA 10611, or the Food Safety Act of 2013. And then, the, as I have mentioned, there is also one executive order, which is the 514 series of 2006, establishment of the national biosafety framework. So uh, there is an old uh, Republic Act, the RA 1556, an act to regulate and control manufacture, importation, labeling, advertising, and sale of livestock and poultry feeds. I could, I could see, I could this particular RA RA 1556 because uh, this is also uh, cross that the issues with regards to feeds or crops that are gen genetically modified. So the Department of Agriculture through the special order issued by the uh, Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Secretary William Dar, he issued the special order number 582, uh, the creation of interagency technical working group for the formulation of the regulatory policy for genetically modified animals and animal products. Uh, it says here the creation of interagency technical working group for the formulation of uh, specifically regulatory policy for genetically modified uh, animals. There are already, or there is already existing uh, policy or special, or, uh, I mean the regulatory framework for plants, uh, modified plants, genetically modified plants. But now we are now into the effort of establishing a separate uh, JDC or Joint uh, Department Circular between uh, departments. And this composed the Department of Agriculture, the Academe, the Department of Science and Technology, and two private uh, groups such as the uh, Biotech Coalition of the Philippines and the Philippine College of Lab Laboratory Animal Medicine. Of course, the Department of Health, which is uh, represented by the Food and Drug Administration and the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine. And then the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. So here it says uh, animal, animal or livestock biotechnology encompasses the proper animal management, rapid diagnosis and modern disease surveillance, uh, increased income for livestock food producers, doubling uh, the climate change and disease resilience or resistant animals. Uh, this only state that uh, uh, animal biotechnology is just an option to increase the uh, productivity of livestock animals, particularly for food as a source of protein by our people in the Philippines. I think that's it, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Claro Mingala. Thank you for offering us the picture of the uh, current uh, initiatives being done in the Philippines, the regulations, different executive orders um, that will guide us in developing animal biotech no? that would be that would not be only beneficial, but it will also be safe for all. I would again would like I would like to again invite you to send us your questions and answers via the Q&A box if you are tuned in via Zoom or the comment section if you are watching us from, the face, from, Facebook, uh, from our Facebook page. So I think it is time for another poll question. Let us see. 
Uh, this, please follow the link to be able to answer today's uh, survey. You can also see this link via the chat, the chat boxes. So this morning we saw different animal, uh, different animals that have been um, developed no? or improved using biotechnology. We also saw different regulations, points to consider in setting up uh, or in using this technology that would ensure its safety for the environment, for consumption, for different aspects uh, that we'd have to uh, take care of. Now let us move on to answering your questions. Please keep them coming and we'll be very happy to answer them in this session. Uh, let me start with a question from Ellen Grace Soberano from the Central Philippine State University from Cabancalan City, Negros Occidental. How safe are GMO products like milk or meat for human consumption? Have there been studies to support that these are safe for human consumption? Thank you. Uh, anyone from our resource persons? Yes, Jerome. Uh, Martin. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a um, it's a very relevant question. Um, as I was saying, um, all over the world, um, uh, every country in the world uses the um, Codex Alimentarius guidelines to assess the safety of foods derived from genetically modified organisms. So we we can divide. Um, uh, in this case, uh, animals uh, that have been developed in laboratories are, and are still regulated, which I mean, which means that they are not in the in the supply of food from those animals that has passed um, a safety assessment, and therefore, if, if the assessment is positive, are allowed to be in the market. In in the case of animals, we only have one case, the the advantage salmon. Uh, in, in, in that case, the salmon has been uh, analyzed as a source of food. Uh, the, uh, as Simon said, the, the, the only difference with this salmon is that it produces um, um, hormone that accelerates its growth. But the hormone also comes from an edible fish. So it's a protein that has been eaten before by humans. Uh, it's not a novel protein in the human diet. And it has been, uh, ne nevertheless, it has been checked again for toxicity, allergenicity, and it was found that the, this, in the, this only difference of having a, an, another protein for uh, another uh, growth hormone, fish growth hormone, uh, is completely safe for, for consumption. And, and it's in very low levels, almost undetectable in food. But at the, sa at the same time, the whole composition of nutrients uh, amino acids, vitamins, uh, anti-nutrients of the of the food derived from the GM salmon uh, has been compared with the contents uh, of the same uh, chemical substances in uh, ordinary salmon, and it was found that the levels are, are the same. So it has the same level of every nutrient, of any anti-nutrient, of any uh, uh, substance that is relevant for food safety. That is how. Uh, regulators know that this, the, in this case, this product is uh, safe for human consumption. And uh, let me assure you that that's a, a level of scrutiny that no other novel food is, um, is passing anywhere in the world. Some, sometimes uh, in, in, in one parts of the world, we have new plants or new animal foods that are introduced. Uh, not non-GMO, but animal or plants coming from other parts of the world, or the animals or plants that have been just uh, bred very recently, and they do not have the same level of intense scrutiny as GMO. So, in in, in, com in comparison with other novel foods, GMOs are the are the safest. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, would you know? Yeah. Would you have an idea how the public uh, reacted? to GM salmon when it was uh, being first introduced? Were they hesitant or 
were they open to it? How difficult was it to introduce it to them then? Well, most of the hesitation was made by politics. Politics. I mean, the thing was, I think the the re, the reaction was not so. Of course, there was reaction from from the public. Some groups were worried because they didn't understand the technology. So so they just just for precaution they didn't want to have it on on their diet or they want to, this product to be labeled so people will know when they buy it if it is GMO or not. But the 20 something years that the Aqua Bounty, Aqua Advantage Salmon took to get to the market was mostly because politicians felt unsafe about um, approving this product and, and fearing that the public will not understand and will not uh, vote them again in the, in the next election. Uh, and another victim of that uh, kind of behavior was this. Um, Envirobig that uh, was mentioned during my presentation. Uh, unfortunately, that was a very interesting pioneer project. Um, uh, it was uh, proven in, in, in a few years that the food from this animal was completely safe to eat. But nevertheless, the, 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 the regulatory system and the politicians, they weren't bold enough to, to take the decision, uh, a decision based on science at that moment in, in, in Canada. Uh, more, more recently, the, the current authorities of Canada were bold, at least in regards to the Aqua, Aqua Advantage Salmon, and they did approve it because the science says they are safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martin. Uh, next one from Richard Dambalo. He is, as, he is asking any one of you to comment on this. Biotechnology-derived salmon, tilapia, and other livestock have an enormous impact in supplying food production demands. However, critical issues remain with regards to the confined production of these animals that increases their susceptibility to diseases, which is normally controlled or regulated with antibiotic-containing feeds or antibiotic injection. The effect of residual antibiotics that are ingested by human end users is still under debate. Uh, can anyone please comment on this? So from, from my perspective, I've been involved in the PERS pig project, so I don't work with fish. But the porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus that we've worked with is one of the biggest contributors to antimicrobial use in pig production. Not because the antimicrobials are useful for tackling the virus, but because when pigs get the virus, they're susceptible to secondary infections. So if we can use technologies like genome editing to reduce disease burden grossly, then there is a really good chance that we can significantly impact antimicrobial use as well. I mean, farmers don't want to use antimicrobials if they don't have to, there's a cost associated with it. So if we can make that less necessary, then we can reduce antimicrobial use in farming. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have also received a few questions addressed to Dr. Mingala on the uh, number or is there any approved animal biotech in the Philippines? Um, the extent of animal biotech in the country that is currently being used or the different genetic improvements that we can anticipate for the next decades in the country. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, with regards to animal biotechnology applications in the Philippines, uh, we already have this uh, uh, system already, particularly in the Philippine Carbo Center. We are doing artificial insemination, uh, embryo transfer. We also do some uh, probiotic development, efforts in vaccine development uh, using bi uh, biotechnology. But with regards to the uh, emerging technologies such as uh, gene editing or genetic engineering, uh, we don't have yet. Uh, I think uh, the only commercialized form of animal biotech is the aqua bounty salmon. 
and uh, that is uh, is still although it's commercialized already in the US and Canada uh, it's not yet uh, popular uh, popularly uh, used particularly in uh, across other countries so yes the philippines is not that far behind with regards to animal biotechnology uh, applications uh, only with regards to the emerging technologies such as the genetic modification and the genetic engineering. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Claro. Now for from Madeline Kingan from Benguet State University. She is interested to know if transgenic animals can breed true to type and how about the consequences if they are bred with non-transgenic stock? Okay, I'll take that. Thank you, Simon. Um, so yes, they can breed true to type. So once you've modified the genome, as far as we are aware thus far, the genetic modifications are stable. Um, the consequence of breeding with non-transgenic stock will depend slightly on the genetic change that you've made. So when I was talking about the hornless cattle, you only need one of two copies of the polled gene to have a hornless cow. So if you have uh, a bull that has both copies of the hornless gene, and it's bred with a horned cow, all of the offspring will be hornless. But if you have a horned bull that only has one copy of the hornless gene and you breed it with horned cows, only half of its offspring will be hornless. For the pers resistant pigs, we need both copies of CD163 to be modified. So to propagate that, you need to breed your modified pigs with other modified pigs. Otherwise, the consequence, if you breed your modified pig with a non-modified pig, the offspring are not resistant to the disease. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Simon. Um, we have another um, from one of our attendees. Are there existing regulatory framework or policies that you know of in other ASEAN countries. Is there an effort to harmonize these regulatory framework or policies in the region from the Philippines? No? The memo from the DA secretary for the interagency task force to formulate a policy for the Philippines was recent, no? July 2020. Is there a timeline for the interagency task force to come up with the draft? I think. Claro can, um, can answer this. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, actually, we already have the draft and it's now being circulated to the various members of the technical working group. Uh, and uh, we are eyeing to have the, the final draft before the public hearing, probably by November or December. So uh, first quarter of next year, we can uh, schedule the public hearing and then the finalization of the uh, guidelines. Thank you, Claro. Um, so once we are able to finish or de develop you know, these materials, these animals from biotechnology, um, from, that, from that point, how do you think how long can we um, how long would it take for our farmers to avail of these biotech animals? It's part of the question uh, coming from one of our farmers. Uh, an estimate, probably, once we are done with the development and the regulation. Yeah, I think that's largely going to depend on the route of dissemination. So my experience is working alongside a breeding company. So it really depends on their push to get the product to market. Mm -hmm. It's very unlikely that anything that we do is going to go directly from a university department, for example, 
into the field for application. This is all likely to be disseminated through breeding companies. So I really can't put a time frame on that because we are absolutely not in control of how, how they work their genetics through their system. It's also likely to depend on the species that we're talking about and the nature of the genetic modification. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Now from a student from LSP Sinaloan here in Laguna, um, he asked, he asked us if, how would this GMO animals affect our native animals? What is the future of our local animals if we will be using or allowing GMO use for farming in the future? Uh, I will try to answer the question. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Philippine Carabao Center has a mandate of doing research in the, increasing the productivity of the Philippine Carabao. But at the same time, we have also have, has a mandate of uh, preservation and conservation of the native water buffalo. So I think there is no such thing or, or it, it could conflict uh, between the two mandates because uh, first, uh, if we are talking about genetically modified uh, animals, uh, in the near future probably, if ever there will be, it would be a confined uh, uh, setting. So it won't be released uh, in, the, in, the, in the field or, or even uh, in the wild. So uh, still, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, things to consider because, uh, you know, there's also various, uh, various uh, level of uh, doing uh, the evaluation assessment, risk assessment. Uh, so I think there, there will be no conflict and we, we can still conserve our native animal as, uh, as, as the same as the, the mandate of the Philippine Carabao Center or even the Bureau of Animal Industry. Uh, they are conserving the native animals, the native pigs, the native uh, poultry, so so that it won't have any conflict with the uh, high yielding animals or what we call the white white uh, pigs or the broiler, etc. Thank you, Clara. Now uh, I think um, this has been a good discussion of uh, regarding animal biotechnology. Uh, um, if you have questions, keep them coming and we'll try to address them later on. Um, rest assured that these, your comments, suggestions, and questions to our speakers will be addressed as soon as possible. Before we uh, close this webinar, may I request our speakers for some uh, closing messages uh, uh, given the potential that we saw this morning through our discussion. Um, your closing messages for the Southeast Asian region and the Philippines as we explore um, maximizing the potential of animal biotechnology for agricultural development. Can we start with Simon, please? Clearly, biotechnology has the potential to have positive impacts on both welfare and productivity in our livestock. And so I think that I'll phrase this rather as a question rather than a statement. Given that we can use this technology to reduce disease and therefore improve welfare and reduce antimicrobial use potentially in agriculture, is it ethical not to do so? Just something for people to think about. Thank you, Simon. Really something um, that we can ponder on later. How about Martin? Thank you, Jerome. Um, um, I, I would like to share that fr from the outside, um, the Philippines is seen la like a regional leader in terms of um, um, the, the, the development of a regulatory framework. Uh, compared to other uh, countries in, in, in their vicinity, uh, neighbor countries, um, Philippines uh, from the outside seem to display 
mo, uh, um, a regulatory framework whose uh, members uh, are more um, knowledgeable of, of science, more bold to take uh, science-based decisions, and, and therefore, um, now, if uh, the Philippines it has the opportunity to revise its uh, regulation on animal biotechnology, I think it's, it's an opportunity to be able to um, have the capacity to assess if any of these novel technologies may be useful for food production in, in the country and therefore contribute not only to, to food security, but also to a more sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. How about Claro? Uh, for the Philippines, any dreams that you'd like for animal yeah. biotech? Yes, yes. Actually, uh, I would just like to remind everyone that biotechnology has a lot of potential in increasing our livestock production. But uh, biotechnology is just one of the options. Uh, biotechnology doesn't uh, take your freedom of choice. So uh, we are, we, the, the scientists or the biotechnologists are off offering this to you, especially the farming communities, the consumers, to uh, sustain our source of food and, ha and have a uh, food security, uh, a community of, uh, with the uh, food security. So again, this is just an option and uh, uh, we are here as a scientist to help you, to help the community in having uh, a food secured community. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you, Dr. Claro. Uh, once again, in behalf of CIRCA and led by our director, Dr. Glenn Gregorio, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to our speakers, Dr. Simon Lilico, Dr. Martin Lama, and Dr. Claro Mingala for uh, sharing your knowledge, your expertise, and your time for this uh, learning session on animal biotechnology. biotechnology. It's an exciting phase um, that we are opening up an option, just like uh, Dr. Claro said, no? that we can achieve you know, better yield, uh, better, pro anim better products, through this technology, through this innovation. So hopefully this would be an additional fuel for us as we work towards agricultural, agricultural development, not just in the Philippines, but also for the region. Before I call on Ma'am Ola of ISA to wrap up our discussion, it is time for our third poll. This would be our last. Please, um, follow the link and let us know your answer. I think among the three poll questions, this is my favorite. So please answer. While you are answering, um, let me call on Dr. Rodora Aldemita of the ISA Southeast Asia Center for her closing remarks. Dr. Ola. Hello, um, good morning everyone. It's almost noon time and I know that there are still exciting questions that you would want to be raised. Actually, there's one here that uh, it was a, it's a good question, but uh, we can respond to you later. But before we proceed, uh, let me remind you of the evaluation form. Uh, is it going to be shared to us? Yes, it will be shared later, Ma'am Ola. Okay, after my closing? Yes. Okay. So this is our, uh, yeah, okay. So I would like to give my uh, closing remarks and at the same time a challenge for everybody on animal biotechnology and biotechnology in general. Actually, animal biotechnology was regarded as the new frontier in the quest for new solutions for the hungry and malnourished global population. It was a new frontier. But when we heard the talks of Dr. Simon Lilico and Dr. Clara Mingala and Dr. Martin Lemma, we know that it's no longer a new frontier because in Canada, we already have started commercializing aquabounty salmon. And it has been, uh, uh, the aquabounty salmon has been developed years, more than 15 years ago, 
but because of regulatory hurdles, it became, it got delayed and delayed. And so finally, since last year, they have commercialized Aquabounty Salmon. We know that there will be more products coming up, as we heard from tops of our speakers. And this will provide us some new uh, traits, some uh, improved animals with uh, new traits to combat climate change. For example, heat resistant cows. And of course, we have for food sustainability, more or much earlier to mature salmon, for example, and with the current use of new breeding innovations that just like genome editing, there will be more traits, there will be more improved animals that will be coming our way that will give impact and uh, will provide more nutritious, healthy and foods that can also improve the economic and nutritional status of the poor and the hungry. So this is an enormous challenge for us to make people know what animal biotechnology is, its potentials and benefits. So to attain these benefits, however, enabling, enabling regulations for the adoption and acceptance of these products from both crop, crops and animals have to be in place, right? So ISA, the International Service for the Acquisition of Agribiotic Applications, in its mandate to help capacitate countries in the developing world to harness the potentials of biotech is open for cooperation and partnership in bioscience as we expand our coverage. We believe in trust and transparency as new biotech products are developed and commercialized. So we invite everyone who are interested to contact us if you have any ideas or if you have any needs on this aspects. So we have learned a lot of things today and we know that still regulation is the bottleneck. There are now harmonizing strategies that are going on in animal biotechnology we know there, there is an ongoing a global workshop on animal biotechnology, and we are seeing some new lights that there could be harmonization and ways to expedite the commercialization, the development and commercialization of uh, products or animal biotech, uh, biotech animals with improved traits. So finally, we would like to thank Sirka for hosting this webinar, the U.S. Embassy represented here by Ryan Bedford. Our panelists, again, Dr. Simon and Dr. Martin and Dr. Claro, and to all our attendees. We have actually accumulated 116 Zoom attendants. I don't know how many we have from Facebook live stream, and we will be posting the video of this webinar in two YouTube channels later. So may I reiterate the importance of the survey, which will be flashed to you later, because it will gauge the perception, understanding, and possible acceptance of animal biotechnology all over the world. We are already broadcasting all over the world, so I hope that we can get some sense of these items from your survey uh, answers. Thank you very much, and good day. Thank you, Ma'am Ola. As she has mentioned, your feedback is very important to us. Please let us know what you think about this webinar and this topic by clicking the link to a quick feedback form, which will be posted in the Circa FB event page. If you are registered via Zoom, you will be redirected to the feedback form before you leave the webinar room. Your feedback is very important to us. For those who wish to receive a, an e-certificate for participating in today's webinar, please visit the link shown on your screen. Please note that we will only accommodate requests for e-certificates within 24 hours after the end of this webinar session. We would also like to inform everyone that we issue hundreds of e-certificates after each webinar. 
please make sure to type in your correct name and email address. Kindly wait for your e-certificate to be issued within 10 working days. Thank you for your understanding and patience. As mentioned earlier, this webinar will be uploaded uh, on our Facebook channel, on our YouTube channels. And do please feel free to reach out to us if you have other questions or if you need more clarification regarding today's topic. Once again, a reminder from Circa, let us help one another get through this COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that as we go along, we will be able to create a community of better, bigger and smarter farmers and farming families, hopefully through animal biotechnology. This is Jerome for Circa. Stay healthy, safe, enjoy the rest of the day. Good morning.